There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another Al Fresco Friday Read. I think it's going to be the last one in a while because of the cicadas and the heat. It's now about 28 degrees. The coolest it's been any time I've been outside for days and days. Cool enough to do a Friday Reads. But I walked this morning at 6.30 in the morning to one of my favorite parks. One that I haven't filmed in yet this year. And I had my headphones on listening to a podcast and I thought, oh, the cicadas are a little noisy, but it should be okay. And then I took the your headphones off. It was deafening. So I had to come back and here I am sitting at a bench in the, the new little park with somewhat green background. Let's see how it goes. I have had a great reading week. It's a Japanese summer holiday here, so I've barely had any work at all. And with the coronavirus and the heat, I have barely left the apartment. So I have been reading up a storm and have lots to tell ya. I started two and one was a bales, which made me start a different one. And the bale was Ingborg Bachmann's Malina, translated from the German by Philip Bohm. And I hated this. The first five pages were just this incredibly boring, difficult to follow description of neighborhoods in Vienna that I didn't give a rat's ass about. And that wasn't a good start. And then I read 10 more pages and it was about some, I couldn't even figure out the gender, but eventually realized woman who was obsessed with a man that she didn't, had never met. And it was so angsty and I thought needlessly confusingly written that I didn't get past page 14 and bailed. I checked out a few reviews and realized that I wasn't going to be missing anything by skipping out on this one. Now Mark Nash loved it. I haven't re-watched his review. In fact, I probably didn't watch his review because I knew I was going to be trying it myself. I suppose I should watch his review and decide whether it might have been the wrong book at the wrong time type of deal, but no, I didn't like it at all and I the only thing I've read by Bachman was one short story in that anthology of short stories by German women writers, and I absolutely loved it. But I couldn't get into this at all. There will be people out there shouting at their screens right now saying, Sean, you only gave it 14 pages. Well, no, I knew. I, I read 14 pages, read a few reviews. I know I, I'm not going to pursue this one, at least not at this time. So that happened. So I replaced it with Ermgard Coin. Gilgi, one of us. I think it's Gilgi because on the very first page, somebody called her Jilgi, and it was spelled with a J instead of a G at the beginning. So I'm pretty sure this is Gilgi. Somebody, please correct me. And Ermgard Coin is based on the first ten pages of this, a, a new favorite because I read last year. I read her 1932 novel, The Artificial Silk Girl, and absolutely loved it. I have a full review which I will link in the show notes, and I was nervous about this one. I love the cover, eh? Because it was a different translator, but uh, based on the first 10 pages, I am not worried about the translation at all. It's just as good as the other one, I think. Jeff Wilkes is the translator here. Ermgard Coyne was a Weimar writer and had a fascinating life story, which I'd like to know a lot more about. And based on how this is starting out, I'm probably gonna become a new favorite. It's about a working woman, I believe in Cologne, but I'm, don't quote me on that part, in the late 20s, early 30s. This one was published when? 1931. So this one, if that's right, if, if I'm understanding the chronology correctly, this was just before The Artificial Silk Girl. It's about a young working woman, very fashionable, very witty, and that's all I can tell you so far. Loving how it's starting out. I haven't started my coffee yet. So that's what I've started. I have finished six books, so I have lots to tell you. I finished Three Sisters by Margarita Liberaki, translated from the Greek by Karen Van Dyck, and I really like this. Almost loved it. I've already posted a Zoom chat with Cecilia and Electra talking about the book. Certainly looks good against this background. So I'm not going to say any more than that. You can check out that chat, but I do recommend this. It wasn't perfect. I had a significant problem with the strange way that the novel ended. 
but for that it would have been a five star read. And I have also finished Night Sleep Death the Stars by George Carroll Oates and this book arrived in the mail the same day that I finished the, the ebook. This was a gift or an exchange of stuff with uh, Will who's a frequent commenter and I think he used to have his own channel. Does a lot of buddy reads with booktubers. He's from America. Do you know who I'm talking about? Will? W-I-L? So he sent me this and he spent so much money sending it to me and I couldn't send him my stuff airmail because Japan has stopped. I traded a couple books with this for this but oh my god you wouldn't believe how much he spent the, the poor guy so I'm gonna be sending him a lot more bales but right now Japan has not sending airmail to the States only sea mail and they're only they're saying instead of the usual two months for sea mail, it's going to be four months. So he's not going to get my stuff forever. And I got this. Um, I read it as an ebook on my exercise bike, but I love this edition, the American edition with the cover. So I'm so delighted to have it. It was a really good book. I had a problem with this that knocked the star off too. I have already filmed my review, and because this is a new release, that video will go to the top of my editing pile. So look for that maybe Sunday loved so much about this i thought it was a really successful novel it's the first full-length novel i've read by jco what is she 80 81 it's such a good novel i had one problem with one storyline slash one character and i will keep you in suspense until my review but really enjoyed this one and recommend it very highly i have also finished winter in sokjo by alisa Shua Dusapin, translated from the French by Anissa Abbas Higgins. And I quite enjoyed this too, but didn't love it. That's all I'll say. I have a Zoom chat that will be posted in the coming days, a Zoom chat with Grace Eichmeyer about this one, so I'll keep you in suspense. But it didn't quite work for me. Uh, beautifully written slash translated. This was about a young French Korean woman working in a rundown guest house in Sokcho, which is a tourist town close to the border of North Korea in South Korea and her connection with a French male guest at the guest house. I have also finished Emily Bitto's The Strays, an Australian novel that won the Stella Prize in 2015 and I love this. This was a five-star read and I'm not going to review it. I think a lot of people have talked about it. Here come the chiquitas, but it's not nearly as loud as it was in the park, with all the big trees surrounding me. It's just the most obnoxious sound. Every year, it's kind of like seasonal trivia about Halloween and Christmas and stuff. I learn about it every year and have completely forgotten it by the next year. And same with these cicadas. They're called semi in Japanese. It's just it's the weirdest insect. They're about the size of my fist. Maybe not quite that big, but they're huge. And they live in the ground, cocoon, or their eggs are in the ground for like something like 17 years. And then they're born, and this is their death song. And it just sounds like a motor. It's just horrible. And then they die and fall down, and they're the ugliest big old mother freaking insects. And that's why this will probably be my last outdoor video until the cicada season is finished, which I think is not for another month. Anyway, um, yeah, I'm not going to review this because it, it's been talked about a lot. I believe Jacqueline, I found out about it from Jacqueline maybe. I know Britta loved it. So let me talk about it at somewhat more length than the other books. This is set in the 1930s in Australia, and it's about a, maybe she's about 12 years old at the beginning of the story. The protagonist, Lily, she befriends Eva, whose parents are artists, and she gets very enmeshed in their family. Her own family is kind of straight-laced, not interesting, and she is so drawn to this family of artists that eventually kind of establish a, almost like a commune of other artists living in the house. And so as she is entering adolescence, she is seeing a lot of stuff going on sexually, artistically and whatnot dramatically around her in this unconventional household that affects her for the rest of her life. And I just thought it was beautifully written. The story was so compelling. 
the frame around it is Lily as a 50 year old or something much later where she reconnects with her old friend Eva from whom she's been estranged for decades and that was less successful than the meat of this novel which is about four-fifths of the novel the 1930s story. I will also say and this didn't budge me off five stars that the artists were so unconventional that I was never convinced I was reading something set in the 1930s and I wish there had been more to show how radical they were. There just wasn't enough of that for me for it to be convincing but it's based on a group of artists in Australia at that time. I didn't care about that because I didn't know anything about it but it didn't matter. I loved it. And again the more modern frame around it was less perfect than the the heart of the novel, the dynamic of friendship between the two young women and the dynamic that she sees and doesn't completely understand as a young, very, as a teenage girl about all this shenanigans going on it gets mixed up in it in a way that uh, everybody re ends up regretting. Emily Bitto has not published anything else as far as I'm aware. I will be lined up to get her next offering. I have also finally finished American Studies by Mark Merlis. This is a gay novel from the 1990s, set in maybe the 1980s, and it's about a 60-something gay white man who is badly beaten by a hustler in his apartment, and he is in hospital recovering and reflecting on the parallels between where he finds himself as an aging queer in the late 80s and his friend and mentor from the McCarthy Pink Menace era of American history back in the 40s I believe or maybe the 50s. I didn't end up liking it. It was three stars. By the end I thought it was too dry. He was not a very emotional person. There's a brittleness and a distance from the story that he's telling to be fair to the book, there are some childhood memories of first love and first blooms of gay sexuality that because of that dryness of the rest of the story were incredibly powerful, but that was not enough for it to go beyond a three-star read for me. And the literary technique failed, I think, in that his mentor, Tom, who killed himself because of the McCarthy era witch hunts and being outed as gay, back in the day when that was illegal, among other things. The narrator knows a lot about it because he was there, but he imagines the rest and it's presented to us as if it's true and that there was something about that in the last third of the book that just didn't work for me at all because fact and history was so important to the story and then suddenly we get a fictionalized account of Tom's last days that was just jarring in terms of what had gone before and what was happening alongside. But mostly this didn't tell the story powerfully enough because there just wasn't enough heart in the book. And finally, I finished last night Ida Jessen's Danish novel, A Change of Time, translated from the Danish by Martin Aitken. Five stars. I absolutely loved it. It was so... I wish I could turn the camera around and show you how hot that guy is. He's been... Holy smokes. Anyway, <laughs> it's just before 7 a.m. and I'm already raring to go here. I think I'm going to do a full review. So let me say enough that if I don't get to it, that I've done it some justice, but without going into all the details. It's fairly newly published. Ida Jessen is a young Danish novelist. The story is historical. It's set in the 19, late 1920s, early 1930s in the boonies of Denmark in the form of diary entries. The writing slash translation is so quirky, simple, deceptively simple as they say. And the protagonist is recently widowed and we soon realize what a, it wasn't a horrible marriage, but what a companionless marriage it was. And she's reflecting on all of that and remembering old first loves and how she first came to the, this community at the beginning of the 20th century. And then things happen that are quite beautiful to 
read about. I thought it was quietly gorgeous. So those are what I finished. Coffee Thursday. <laughs> I uh, haven't told this story for a while, but I had an old gay friend in back in Saskatchewan decades ago, sadly, no longer with us, died very young from HIV. And he was a, he was an actor and he was cr batshit crazy in the most wonderful, loving, hilarious way. And I remember once at the local gay bar in Saskatoon, Glenn came out with this line that he was very self-deprecatingly telling me a story about some guy he was interested in that wasn't interested in him. And as the guy walked away, <laughs> Glenn called out in the campiest, gayest voice, Coffee Thursday! <laughs> so I always use that when I'm feeling like somebody who I'm very interested in doesn't know I'm alive and I call it Coffee Thursday! <laughs> in memory of dear darling Glenn. Yes, so I, yeah, really great reading week and I've got two more days until I go back to work next week and even next week my uh, teaching schedule's a bit light. So I will be able to do a lot more reading coming up. Let me close with this. I have no idea what I'm going to pick up next. One of the things that's a casualty of how scheduled and readathon and buddy reading related my reading ends up being because I'm committing myself to this, that, and the other thing is that one of the things that goes is spontaneity in terms of what I'm going to read next. So I have decided and have already been enjoying the process of just sampling a few books here and there. Some of them are on Scribd, some of them are ebook. Well, mostly ebook, so Scribd and what I've already purchased. Because I'm doing now a lot of reading on my exercise bike because I'm on the exercise bike for an hour a day. That's why I finished the Joyce Care Oats so quickly. So I'm going to start something on ebook, and I don't know what yet. And I'm having a really good time. It might be a new addition to my Women in Translation reading. It might be something completely different than that. And I am indulging myself in spontaneous play with the books on my ebook shelf. So I'm just kind of in a mood to start something without much forethought. I also wanted to give a shout out to my friend Lindy, who you've met on my channel. She lives in Edmonton and she's a reader extraordinaire and a dear friend of mine. And she is involved in the Shadow Giller this year. The Giller is one of Canada's most prestigious, lucrative prizes. I wasn't aware. I don't follow book prizes in general and I don't have never followed the Giller particularly. but. The long list is going to be an announced, I believe, at the end of August or early September. And for several years, there was a book blogger who sadly has now passed on that did a Shadow Giller thing where he would read whatever was out there and eligible for the prize in terms of Canadian lit and try to second guess what they might pick and critique or react to the long list and then the short list. And now that he has passed on. I don't, sorry, I don't know his name. Three or four book bloggers are continuing the tradition and Lindy is one of them this year. So I wanted to have her back on my channel to talk about what she's reading, but I am just booked up solid until after the long list is released. So I think I'm going to have her on after the long list to see what she thinks of the long list. And again, I, I don't really care so much about promoting the book prize as I do about promoting Lindy and her wonderful reading. And she's putting as are the other book bloggers that are part of the Shadow Giller. She's posting reviews on the Shadow Giller blog, which I'll link below, and her own blog. And she's found some good stuff, some of which I have already purchased, and one of which is on Scribd and may be the book that I choose. It actually wasn't Lindy, but somebody else tweeted last night, just as I was falling asleep, I saw a tweet from another blogger. I don't know if that blogger is connected officially with the Shadow Giller, but she said she hoped this novel would be on the list. And Lindy replied to that tweet saying, this book sounds really good, but I would have to put a paper cover on it because of the chicken with its head cut off on the cover. So Lindy, now you know which one I'm considering. It's on Scribd. I'm going to give it a little try later today. 
thanks for watching.